So Tony, I hate misquoting people. So I actually wrote down your quote because it, it really hit me. Uh, and and I, maybe you can amplify on this. You said, cancer feels like a punch that leaves you breathless. So what was it like when cancer landed that punch with you? Um, well, uh, I've had that experience a couple of times, uh, uh, Mike. Uh, the first was with my mom when I found out that she had cancer, breast cancer. And uh, it's almost surreal. You almost can't quite believe it when it happens. Um, and then when she had the surgery, I thought, oh, I'm sure we'll get it all. And then the surgeon comes out and says, uh, we might have gotten it all, but it's pretty, pretty close to the margins. So it's almost this um, uh, kind of irrationally, almost exuberant hopefulness that things will be, you know, always falling on the good side of the range of possibilities. So, uh, and then, uh, you know, and then my mom has done great. Uh, she's a survivor of breast cancer now for five years and no sign of recurrence, everything's super. But like anyone with cancer, you know, even when you think that you've done everything and even when everything looks as good as you could possibly hope, you know, you're always wondering, could there have been a few cancer cells that escaped the treatment uh, to come back and cause problems someday? So it's, you know, it's, so the, the punch in the stomach aspect of it is, you know, is the immediate impact. But, but for any cancer patient, it's not a sprint, it's a marathon. The second punch hit Tony directly. I had had some hip pain for three months ahead of getting an x-ray. I thought, I'm just getting to be old, I'm going to need my hip replaced. Uh, and Sabelle, my wife, said, you need to go get an x-ray. I took Advil, that made it better. Finally, I went to get an x-ray. And, uh, and as I'm looking at, at the x-ray and looking at my hips, my hips look okay. And I'm not an x-ray expert, but I do know that I'm supposed to compare the left side and the right side overall. And I see this big hole in my left hip. And that's when I knew you know, I had cancer. Uh, kind of in an instant that I knew that I had cancer. And then really the question is, you know, what kind of cancer, how bad is it? It's not good. You have this, you know, you have this big thing in your pelvis that's eating the bone. Uh, and, and really then the question is, how bad is it? And so what, and, and really that comes down to what kind of cancer is it? And so in that, you know, so in that period, <clears throat> and again, it's surreal. It's hard to believe that, you know, it's hard to believe that that's your x-ray and that, and that this is, you know, you're thinking about stuff that's directly related to you. And so um, there's this period of probably a day where you really don't know whether you're going to live for, you know, a few months or whether you have the possibility of living for, for many years. I probably was the best prepared myeloma patient in history because I'm a hematologist, I'm a researcher, I studied this kind of thing. So I don't know that anyone would have been better positioned to have myeloma than me, Mike. But, uh, but even then, you know, you're trying to understand this as, as kind of a medical and scientific problem, almost like a chess match in a way. And again, try to position yourself to, uh, you know, to do well, not just in the short term, but in, in the long term as well. Kind of a, a near term view, but then also very importantly, I think this longer term view of, of how do I position myself to, you know, ideally live to be a little old man someday. Uh, and, you're, and, you know, when Sabelle got home that night and they told her what was going on, I kind of had, I, I guess the way that I thought about it was adopting the mindset of, you know, how do we deal with this if it really is the worst case scenario? What if, it, you know, what if this really is kind of approaching, you know, the end of, a per, uh, of my life? And just trying to... That's tough <coughs> stuff, though, isn't it? It, it? Of course, of course. Yeah, no, it's... it's but I, I, guess the, I guess maybe naturally, I, it's kind of very opposite of what I've told you about the way that I've thought about my mom. <clears throat> Whereas hope, you know, imagining the best of everything. When it was for me, I was imagining, you know, let's try to figure this out if it really is, 
you know, going to be this entreat, uh, in, untreatable thing that's just going to, you know, take over quickly. Let's try to, you know, tr begin to think about getting the ducks in the row. And then it turned out with further testing the next morning, during that day, I found out that I have multiple myeloma. And Sabelle will tell you when she found this out, she said, oh, I'm so happy my husband has multiple myeloma. <laughs> because it was a best. Explain why, <laughs> though. I mean. Because it was, a, you know, it was probably the best, uh, best thing that I could have had. With that set of problems that had been you know, figured out, this hole in my hip and, and other things, there could have been cancers that are not treatable or very easily treatable that I probably would have you know, died of quickly. Multiple myeloma. Uh, is a form of blood cancer. It involves an immune cell and the bone marrow. I used to take care of patients with multiple myeloma. I'm a hematologist, so when I first came to Seattle to learn how to do stem cell transplantation and take care of patients with this type of illness, uh, patients with my multiple myeloma did very poorly. Uh, it is really a difficult uh, disease. I tell people that back then, 20, 30 years ago, it was simple. There were two drugs. They didn't work very well, and pretty much everyone died. And, you know, I happen to have the amazing good fortune of having developed multiple myeloma now at a time when there's been a revolution of new treatments. Uh, you know, uh, probably uh, 20 new treatments that have been developed that work amazingly well uh, and have dramatically altered the, the, the futures of people like me. So I, I live in this time, in this remarkable time that's incredibly dynamic of uh, you know, massive progress, massive changes, and I've been, an, I've been the beneficiary of all of that. New cancer therapies are continually becoming available to patients thanks in large part to genetic editing. One innovative therapy is called chimeric antigen receptor or CAR T-cell therapy. It uses the patient's own genetically modified T-cells to find and kill cancer cells. And we may see more gene engineering options. China is leading the world in research using the CRISPR editing technique which is cheaper, faster, and more efficient than other existing genome editing methods. The U.S. has a handful of clinical trials using this method to find treatments for lymphoma and melanoma. But how do researchers make sure cutting-edge discoveries reach patients? Tony and Sabelle collaborated on a clinical trial for women diagnosed with triple-negative breast cancer, a rare form that's difficult to treat. I used to tell people that I would understand more. I, I had the ability as a researcher to understand more about what was going on in a mouse in my lab uh, than my wife, Sabelle, uh, would have in understanding what's happening to her patients. And that's because as a researcher, I'm unfettered by any sort of concern about the type of testing that I'm using to understand what's going on. I have, I have access to anything that I want, the very latest technologies, the most sophisticated technologies. Now when you take that, and so, so when I have access to those technologies, I create an immense amount of information, but, I, but it doesn't mean that I understand what it all means. I understand what some of it means. It gives me some hints of things, uh, and, and so, I, so it's, it's not like it's rock solid information, but I have lots of different ways of looking at this. When Sabelle's seeing a patient, she has a list of clinically validated tests that she can uh, use to try to understand what's going on in the patient. So you check this and you check that. You can't do these you know, multi-dimensional, you know, uh, extremely sophisticated tests. You can't go to a patient and say, hey, Mike, let me, let me check your blood and we'll che you know, check for all these. And I don't know what that means, Mike, or I don't know what that means, or that means, you know, here's a little bit of what you know, I understand. So, so, so clinical medicine requires, is built on this bedrock of validated tests where I know what this is. I know, when I do this, I'm gonna get this result and I know what it means. So the, so the willingness and the ability to kind of venture off 
into the, into the unknown uh, is something that's available to me in, in the research environment that's not available to patients. Now, I think that makes all the sense in the world. Who would want to be doing these crazy kinds of tests to a, to a human being, except when you know that the tests that you do have available to you aren't good enough, when you know that you can throw everything that you have at that patient and they're still going to die, then how can you, you know, then, then you know, how, who is this firewall protecting then from the, from the more exploratory types of tests versus the kind of tests that we, you know, hang our hats on? And that's the kind of barrier that we were aiming to knock down. Tony's cancer is now in remission, and his journey was the impetus for the couple to create All for Cure, an online platform for patients, clinicians, and researchers to share information about cancer treatments. The first phase focuses on patients diagnosed with multiple myeloma. Talk to me about, was it a discussion you had with your wife? I mean, how did it come about, and what's the goal? Uh, so um, my whole career, a professor and a researcher, taking care of cancer for the last 10 years. When I now, four years ago, become a cancer patient, uh, from my now reluctantly one perspective, I appreciated a problem that I hadn't really thought of in the same way before. And, 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 and from my patient's perspective, I feel like I'm stuck in this 1960s TV game show called Let's Make a Deal with Monty Hall where contestants are asked to choose between three doors. Uh, you know, behind door one's a new car, door two's maybe a trip to Butte, Montana, and door three's a, a goat. And as a patient, I, I'm confronted with these choices. About what treatment am I supposed to take? I, I open the door, I take the consequences, I go down the path a bit, and I'm confronted by the next set of doors. And the point is that I'm not the first one to experience these choices or the consequences of my choices. Thousands of other people have preceded me, yet their experiences aren't available to me. And that's the lost information that All for Cure aims to capture. What we're, what we're building is, an, uh, is a knowledge sharing platform that will allow me as a patient, as a myeloma patient, to look at my options and then have those options be informed not just by my doctor or by reading papers or publications, but what if those decisions could be informed by what thousands of other people chose to do and what their outcomes were. And then as I, and then as I make my choice and I have my outcome, I add to that ever-growing knowledge base so that with every patient's experience, we become progressively smarter about how cancer works. So what we're really aiming to do is develop something analogous to the traffic navigation app Waze for, for myeloma and then eventually all cancers. And this isn't just about treating cancer, figuring out what the best next treatment for my cancer is. It's about survivorship. And it's this sharing structure that's fascinating because you can learn from other patients, but you can learn from experts in the field. Uh, it's, it's giving you a resource that you wouldn't generally have. I mean, I could, I could live here in Washington, D.C. I could put this out there and suddenly someone in Switzerland might have a key, a key move for me to make in this chess game that you were talking about that I otherwise would not have. That's correct. So uh, we have, so uh, of the patients now who are participating in All for Cure, so All for Cure, we have an on online platform, we call it a knowledge sharing platform for patients, clinicians, and researchers. And we're focused initially on multiple myeloma. And so if you're a patient with myeloma, you register on our platform, and we also ask you to send us all of your medical records from all of the institutions where you've received care. And then our team will take the information from your medical records to extract a data set that is displayed then graphically on your own personalized dashboard. So it's a cool picture that shows everything that's happened to a patient from the time of diagnosis to the present, 
And then beneath that is a discussion panel where any other participant, be they other patients, clinicians, or researchers, can comment on my specific situation. And, and we remove the patient's name, we assign a number so it's de-identified, uh, but this, this platform and this way of doing things has, has allowed us to help a lot of people, as, you, as you've suggested. All for Cure is an example of a broader move towards precision or personalized medicine. This approach allows doctors to prescribe treatments based on an understanding of a patient's genetic, clinical, and environmental factors. But researchers have yet to figure out all the genetic changes that cause a cancer to develop and spread. The key point that I think people don't adequately uh, appreciate is that uh, a lot of people know that uh, if I have multiple myeloma, I do have multiple myeloma, my multiple myeloma will be different from somebody else that has multiple myeloma. They, they, I might respond to treatment that doesn't work for them or vice versa. But what's often not appreciated is that when I was diagnosed with multiple myeloma, there were probably easily hundreds of billions of myeloma cells, tumor cells in my body. And, and so that sounds scary, but don't be scared by that. That's, for, that's the first thing. Second thing is that if you look closely enough at my myeloma, at each cell of those hundreds of billions, each tumor cell will be slightly different from every other tumor cell. So it's not like this homogeneous mix, you know, just sheets of myeloma cells where they're all the same. They'll all be subtly different from every other myeloma cell uh, because, you know, they'll be on, on a genetic level, on a DNA level, there'll be tiny, tiny differences. Now, most of those differences don't matter. You know, it doesn't allow the cell to be meaner or resist treatment. But if you're looking on a scale of hundreds of billions of cells, occasionally a cell will differ in a way that might make it resist treatment, the next treatment you're gonna take. And so thinking about this as a problem set, I wanna kill all of the tumor cells. That's my goal. Uh, but in multiple myeloma, despite all of the amazing treatments that exist, it's probably hard to kill every last tumor cell. The approach that I've taken is, you know, let's use treatment to knock down that number of tumor cells to the lowest possible level, uh, reducing the population maybe to as few as a million cells rather than hundreds of billions, and then try to keep them down. Precision medicine requires gathering large clinical and molecular data sets and then analyzing that data to diagnose, treat, and perhaps one day even prevent cancer. As we build this database that currently has hundreds of patients but will eventually grow to tens of thousands and millions of patients of treatments and responses, and as we, as we incorporate things like artificial intelligence and machine learning, what we'll be able to do, I think, much more accurately is tell the patient, you know, based on the characteristics of your myeloma, based on the treatments that you've responded to previously, what, what's worked for you and what hasn't worked for you at this, at this stage and other kinds of testing. We think, you know, based on, based on you know, this sophisticated computational analysis that you are more likely to respond to this treatment than that treatment. We will never arrive at a stage where we're always right about that, but we will get better with every patient's experience.